Continue. Welcome, everyone. I want to introduce Dr. Black to you. He is our presenter. I want to say thank you for everybody for joining us. I will be turning it over to Dr. Black. I am your room host, Mickey Sanchez, Center Supervisor at Mills Park. I want to welcome everyone to this day. Dr. Black, it's all yours. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us here. Um, glad to be part of the Women's Health Conference and Business Expo and to hopefully uh, shed some light on dentistry today. So the topic of today's uh, meeting is your teeth tells your story. It's prevention is to keep a healthy smile. So I wanna first and foremost start off by saying we all are born with 32 teeth in our mouth and we don't all always leave this earth with those 32 teeth in our mouth. So there are a number of things that we can do on a daily basis to ensure our oral health and to make sure that we are in total health wellness as well. So I'd like to touch up upon gum disease a little bit, periodontal disease. And that is the uh, disease that is caused by bacteria. It's caused by plaque. And we found that uh, when your gums are inflamed, and bacteria from the mouth start to enter and get into the bloodstream, we can possibly have more complications and more complications within the body. Uh, to name a few, cardiovascular disease. There's uh, growing links now between the link between cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease. And what we found is that the bacteria in the mouth that create this inflammation they can initiate all types of infiltration of host cells, uh, inflammatory mediators that will in turn enter into the liver, into, enter and stimulate and secrete all types of uh, inflammation in the bloodstream. And this is called systemic inflammation. So there is a, a link between oral health and systemic health. And so that is something that I find in private practice that is, um, that is uh, not known or not widely known. People come into my office and they assume that it's just my teeth. And what are you going to do with this tooth? Or what are you going to do with that tooth? And my goal at this point in my career is to impress upon patients the importance of oral health as it relates to their general health. So getting back to cardiovascular disease, we found that there is quite a bit of systemic inflammation and it, it, will, it will cause uh, uh, cardiovascular disease to worsen at times and cause people with heart problems to have different cardiac episodes. Um, this, is, this is probably the most serious that I've seen. And I have had a number of uh, patients come in and they have uh, their upcoming uh, heart, heart surgeries with their cardiologists, and they've been asked to see a dentist or an oral surgeon to find out where the source of inflammation is coming from. And oftentimes it, it is from the mouth. And in that case, we would have to do treatment, possibly deep cleaning, maybe periodontal surgery, or possibly even removing the teeth altogether to reduce that inflammation. So that I think is the most important link. So if I can continue, I'll talk about another uh, systemic link again, because uh, the topic is your teeth tells your story, prevention to keep a healthy smile. So I'm just overviewing now the links of why your mouth, why your teeth are so important to your overall health and your overall body. So let's continue with the second link that, that I've noted is diabetes. So 
I'll just read this from my notes. It says the presence of any gum inflammation can make it much more difficult for a diabetic to control its blood sugar. Elimination of any gum inflammation can directly improve a diabetic's glucose control. So we all know people that have diabetes. There is type one diabetes and there's type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is insulin independent. Insulin dependent, excuse me. Type two diabetes is insulin independent. So most, uh, and type one is juvenile onset. So that's in the earlier stages of life. Type two diabetes are patients that have poor ability to control blood sugar. They are usually on medications such as oral hypoglycemic agents and also insulin. Um, that's another finding that has been documented of the link between gum disease and diabetes. And there's quite a few, uh, I don't have any statistics on diabetes in, in the nation, but we all know that diabetes is a very prevalent disease and there's oral implications. So most diabetics have poor wound control, poor infection control. And uh, we've heard uh, of it getting so severe that it can lead to uh, 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 amputations of feet, limbs. Not always is this the case. However, it is hard for the diabetic to control their blood glucose level. And data has shown that patients with gum disease have a hard time controlling their blood glucose level. So by treating the mouth, by eliminating the harmful bacteria, uh, we found that diabetics can, can better control their blood sugar. Um, the third link that is, is not as widely known, but there are studies that have shown that um, there is a link between gum disease and Alzheimer's disease. The link is not quite understood yet, However, it is, there is a substantial link about the, uh, the plaques that form during Alzheimer's disease and that those plaques have similar uh, type of bacterial infiltration that the mouth contains, the type, same type of bacteria. So Alzheimer's disease is, a, is on the forefront as a medical condition that is very serious. And there is, again, a link between the mouth and Alzheimer's disease. Not so substantial as diabetes and heart disease, but it still is present. Uh, the third, the four, uh, fourth link that I found was the lungs. The bacteria that collect in the mouth when gum disease is present are the same bacteria that can cause pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. So oftentimes you hear of, of someone that has come down with uh, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and they've been entered into the hospital. And what they found is when they, if they can take a culture, they will find that the, that most of the bacteria are called bacterioides. There are different species, streptococcus, staphylococcus, pneumococcal bacteria. And those are all the same bacteria that I remove every day in the mouth. So they've, they've transferred and, and, and gotten into the bloodstream and created uh, respiratory problems, uh, lung problems. Uh, there have been some data uh, about COVID and the viral particles and bacterial uh, respiratory problems that are also related to bacteria that could be from the mouth. So th those are a few different uh, links that we found for uh, between the mouth and and um, the link between gum disease and systemic illness. Uh, another one is the kidneys. The bacteria often enter the body through the mouth, and with poor oral care, the infections progress faster, and the, this increases the the disease. The kidneys must fight off. So again, we're talking about inflammation. We're talking about infection caused by bacteria, not a virus, not a fungus, but by bacteria. And that's what we see in the mouth. So in order to keep our teeth healthy for our entire lifetime, we have to remove the bacteria. Uh, I found that most patients 
in my 20 years of practice, say they brush, say they floss. However, they don't do a very good job at it. And that's where dentists will come in. Dentistry uh, is able to examine, treat all the diseases of the mouth. And patients really think they're doing a good job when in fact, they probably are not. Even the healthiest of patients have um, high degrees of bacteria in the mouth, the biofilms that, that grow in the mouth after meals. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, more of the links um, again between gum disease and there's another study that came out uh, not very recent but that periodontal disease can lead to stroke. I don't know much about that study but again the inflammation in the mouth seeps through the capillaries and it will enter the bloodstream in a small degree enough that it could block a blood vessel. It could trigger a stroke. Uh, another another uh, link, and I'm touching on these links so that we can stay focused on the mouth as it relates to the whole body. And again, in private practice, what I see is patients come in, they have isolated toothaches, isolated bleeding points, possibly isolated um, pains in their mouth. And they just don't know where they come from. And it seems to me that it's a mystery to them. And they possibly have been to multiple practices, mul mul multiple practitioners in search of an answer. And then I quickly can see that it's related to this bacteria. It's related to bacteria that's under the gum line. And if I had some more presentation material, I could really show how these bacteria infiltrate the mouth. Uh, osteoporosis leads to bone loss in the jaw. Um, that's another link link that we have. So as we as we uh, see roots, the roots of the teeth, they sit in the jawbone. All of us that do have teeth, they sit in the jawbone. So this bacteria hovers and sits on the bone and it causes destruction. And that's essentially how the teeth get loose and fall out. So there is a, a definite connection between osteoporosis and bone loss in the jaw. We've seen this over and over. So let's, let's continue. Uh, there's more connections. Obesity contributes to inflammation throughout the body. And this further increases the risk of infectious disease and contributes to periodontitis, diabetes, and heart disease. So I'm looking at, at some data that shows us the connection. And I think once we all put the connection together, we can see relatively how the mouth and the body are relating and they're not two separate entities. So let, let's go through again and, and let me somewhat illustrate here how someone can help take care of these episodes. And how, and again, going back to the relationship between the body and the mouth. So I've been in close uh, contact with a lot of medical doctors in the community, in our community. And what we've found is that we need to screen patients. Most adults should see the dentist every six months, twice a year. So that's an unknown. And, and that's important for detecting these harm, harmful bacteria and finding out and taking x-rays during the examination process to determine what, how, how strong the teeth are, how much bone is lost. If there's any type of gum inflammation, evaluating the patient's complete medical history. This is something that I do on a comprehensive evaluation. We examine the patient's complete history. Possibly they're taking medications again for diabetes. They're possibly taking medications for blood pressure, high blood pressure medications, um, high cholesterol medications. Those are the three most common that, that are prevalent in our society today is blood pressure, 
and cholesterol, as well as uh, diabetes. So they all are related. So how can we prevent this? How can we, how can we save our teeth? And again, keep our smiles healthy. Well, let's start with two visits to the dentist every year. Just as most people will see their medical doctor once a year for an annual physical, we should see the dentist twice a year. And sometimes, in fact, in, in my office, we have a system called the periodontal maintenance program where patients will come into the office and have their scaling and deep cleanings done four times a year because the data has also showed that plaque and other harmful bacteria will coagulate. It, it will form tartar, the hardness that you might see on your lower teeth, especially on the bottom, on the tongue side. And patients don't know what it is. They say, what is this? And they run into the office and say, what's going on here? And it's plaque, it's tartar. We're back to the bacteria. We're back to, and I can get very scientific about the bacteria. There, there's more, uh, there's bacterioides, there's streptococcus. If there's any doctors on the panel, they know what I'm speaking of. There's staphylococcus, there's pneumococcal, there's lactobacillus. They're all, there's different types of bacteria. Where do the bacteria come from? The bacteria come from the foods that we eat and the acids that are produced in our mouths. So one, and it varies from person to person. It's affected by our diet. Suppose that you have a diet where you eat a lot of sugary snacks, you eat a lot of carbohydrates, let's just say chicken and waffles, um, French fries, potato chips. Those type of foods will create more of an acid in the mouth when it's mixed with saliva. Once the saliva meets our food, when we're chewing and digesting our food, remember the digestion of the food starts in the mouth. There is an enzyme called salivary amylase, which will mix with our foods as we chew and help us to digest our foods, help us to swallow the foods and break them down. Without that enzyme, we'd be chewing our foods for a long time. So this enzyme will start to mix with the foods and it will start to create an acid. And that acid starts to form the moment we start to eat. So we're chewing our foods, we're chewing slowly, and hopefully we have back molars in the back of our mouths to chew our foods properly. If we don't, then we need to see the dentist and to um, talk about replacements for missing teeth because the back teeth I found are very important in that they help us to chew our food, digest our food. So going back to the links again, between gum disease, heart disease, whole body health and wellness, I found that many patients particularly elderly patients that don't have any teeth or we call them edentulous, will have digestive issues. They'll have a hard time chewing their foods. It may take an edentulous patient three, to five, seven times longer to chew a normal meal. Let's just say a hamburger. And my patients, they all say they're doing fine without their teeth, but they really know they're not. And when they, we finally make them prosthetics and dentures and partials and what, whatnot, they're able to chew their foods more properly. They're able to have a greater degree of digestive health. So again, more links between the mouth and the body and how to keep your, your smile healthy. So I just wanted to touch upon um, the uh, missing teeth. So as patients don't have teeth or they're, they're missing tooth, suppose you're missing an incisor, you're missing a bicuspid, you're missing a molar. It affects your ability to chew. It affects your ability to bite. And this can be very problematic. 
So you, we all know people that don't have proper nutrition. Um, patients, uh, elderly patients sometimes don't have the proper nutrition they need to thrive, which could lead to multiple other problems. And it starts again in the mouth. It starts with how we're chewing our foods, how we're eating our foods. Uh, these are some of the functions of the mouth. And that's the main function is the, the mastication, chewing of foods and digesting of foods. But let's get back to the bacteria. If we have this bacteria in our mouth and it's not removed every day through daily brushing, daily flossing, and good oral hygiene habits, the bacteria continue to accumulate. And once they accumulate, once they accumulate, they will start, you will start to notice the gums will get red and swollen and tender. So I'm sure after this presentation, everybody will probably look into the mirror and they might say, hmm, my, red, my gums are a little red here. They are a little swollen or they are a little tender. Uh, sensitivity is uh, a symptom of, of gum disease. I see that quite frequently patients present to the office and they simply say, I'm just sensitive. I can't eat anything. And upon further examination, you find that again, it's gum disease. It's an it's inflammation of the gum tissue. And if we dig a little deeper and I didn't bring a periodontal probe, but how I started a gum examination is I, I have a probe it's called a periodontal probe and it has small measurements and those small measurements are in increments of millimeters. Everything in the mouth is very, very small. So we measure the pocket depths. So I, I consistently measure pocket depths on all patients. And in uh, and, and doing that, I'm determining where and how much bone have they lost. So this is a tooth. The, the bone, the tooth should sit all the way in the bone. Now suppose through gum disease and this bacteria that we've been discussing, it starts to drop. The bone level, your actual jaw bone is dropping and it's dropping and, at, and throughout our life, it continues to drop unless the bacteria infection is controlled. And then what happens just like a tree without a good foundation, the tree will start to loosen and it will start to, to bend. And so this is what patients present with is teeth sometimes that are loose. And they say, well, how did it get that way? It got that way from the bacteria, the bacteria sitting in our mouths, from the foods that we eat, from the drinks that we consume. And as it sits in all of us, whether we're healthy, whether we're in the middle or the moderate stages, this bacteria will proliferate. We've all heard of morning breath. So it's true, there is morning breath. And don't ask your spouse, but brush well at nighttime because as we sleep with a closed mouth, the bacteria will proliferate overnight even more. And you'll wake up and you'll notice, and I will notice, I'm a dentist, but I have a mouth as well, that there might be an odor, there might be a taste it doesn't quite taste right. And that's the bacteria that forms in our mouth when our mouth is closed. I'm speaking now, so my salivary flow is, is, is normal. But when we're sleeping and our mouth is closed, there's not a lot of oxygen. And there's, there's bacteria called anaerobic bacteria and they start to form and anaerobic simply means in without oxygen or in without oxygen being present so they they can proliferate and grow quickly when when there's no oxygen there's other uh, bacteria called aerobic bacteria which feed off of oxygen and they grow in that presence remember these are the same bacteria in our mouth that will infiltrate in through the circulatory capillary system and possibly spread into extremities and spread towards lungs, heart. And that's where this link has been established. So let me review again, since I do have some time, let me review the um, 
stages of gum disease. There's four stages to periodontal disease, gum disease. And the first is called gingivitis. So we've all seen Colgate and Crest ads that say prevent gingivitis. Um, brush with Colgate, brush with Crest, brush with this. Personally, as a dentist, it doesn't really matter to me. And patients ask me every day, what do I use? What can I use? What can I buy? And it really doesn't matter. It's just that you do need a good fluoridated toothpaste that has fluoride in it. And I can touch upon fluoride a little bit in this presentation, but you do need a good toothpaste that's ADA approved, such as a Colgate or Crest. I don't know AIM, if AIM is not. It's, that's an older toothpaste, but Colgate and Crest are your best bets. And they have fluoride, a substantial uh, uh, percentage of fluoride, which helps to remineralize the enamel, the tooth structure. Um, the enamel is our outer coating of our, of our teeth. I, did, I didn't bring my model, but the enamel is the outer coating of the crowns of our teeth. And that's the teeth that we see when we smile and lovely smiles. And we have to keep that enamel strong. It's uh, similar to a bone. It's, it has the same chemical makeup as bone. Um, it's made of a high hydroxy appetite, which is the makeup of our bone, skeletal bones. So enamel is the hardest substance in the body. And it is slightly harder and more dense than bone. But what we found is that these acids in the mouth particularly citric acids uh, can erode the enamel. Um, there's, there's been quite, quite a bit of studies, white papers about clinical uh, acid attacks, acid erosion. We used to see acid erosion in bulimic patients that were um, vomiting. Uh, it would be in uh, patients that would, you would suck on lemons oranges. You all know people that, have, that suck on lemons and citric acid uh, limes that causes an acid erosion. And along with the bacteria in the mouth can create significant damage to your teeth. Um, I have restored quite a bit of uh, mouths due to acid erosion. That's another topic. But um, I was focusing basically on the bacteria and the bacteria content that's in the mouth. So getting back to the stages of gum disease, uh, stage one is called gingivitis. And in that stage, you will notice some slight bleeding of the gum tissue, possibly bleeding when you brush your teeth in the mornings, possibly some bleeding when you're eating, uh, possibly bleeding if you uh, if you're, use a toothpick maybe, and you might, and you say, why is my mouth bleeding? And nowhere else in the body uh, besides the mouth, would there be concern? If, if you were bleeding on your leg, you clearly would know there was a problem. But for some reason, as uh, patients, we feel that it's okay for the mouth to bleed a little bit. And patients ask me all the time, they say, is it okay for my mouth to bleed? And I say, no, it's not. That's not normal at all. It's not okay for the mouth to bleed. Healthy mouths should not bleed unless severely provoked. So that's the first stage is gingivitis. Um, it requires just a simple cleaning. You do need to brush and floss better and you should see your dentist and or hygienist and have a thorough cleaning done. So this is uh, the topic of, I'd say in in a society, patients will come in and say, I need my cleaning. And I've trained the front office to say, well, you have to be, come into the office and have an examination because we have to determine what type of cleaning you need. Not everybody's the same. All individuals weren't made the same. Well, the type of cleaning that Dr. Black needs is different from the type of cleaning that Angela Ross needs or Dr. Fields needs. We all have a different biochemical makeup. We all have different health histories. We all have different uh, issues within our body. So 
we may need to spend particular time or, or careful consideration in certain areas. There may be deeper pockets. There may be bone loss in certain areas, depending on uh, the condition of the mouth. So that's uh, the first stage. The second stage is early periodontal disease. I see that most frequently. Uh, statistics show that that 75% of the American population does have some form of gum disease, meaning type one or higher. So that means everybody, so three out of four people have some type of gum condition. Um, so type two is early stage. And in that, in that area, you, you will see more pronounced bleeding, swelling, inflammation, and sensitivity and some discomfort. Uh, it, will, it will provoke you to come to the dentist in type two because you'll wanna know what's wrong and you'll want to get a remedy quickly. So type two involves treatment called scaling and root planing, which essentially is going below the gum line and removing the harmful bacteria that's below the gum line where the patient cannot brush. So most of us brush in a vertical or horizontal manner like this. And it's just a, a human nature, hap stance, you brush 20 seconds and you're out the door. But we found that you're missing the harmful bacteria. Um, horizontal brushing is very bad, by the way. You wanna always brush vertically and in sm circles, small circles, never horizontally because you're starting to wear the gum tissue away if you brush in that manner. But that's type two. Type two involves the early stage of gum disease. And this is the stage that is the most um, harmful because the bacteria infection is acute. Um, the, uh, the, the pain level can, can be moderate, I, I've seen, mild to moderate, usually not severe, but, but moderate. And the patient will come in with the common complaint and, of uh, my gums are bleeding and my teeth hurt. And the myth is that they assume they have cavities. So that's the first myth that I want to dispel in today's modern society is that it's usually not cavities. We usually as adults, unless you're under, under 12 years of age, 13, 14 years of age, you shouldn't have too many cavities if you take care of your mouth properly. Um, so that's the myth is that the patient comes in and says, I must have a cavity here. And I, upon examination, x-rays, I'll find there's no decay. There's no tooth decay. Decay is, 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 is different from gum disease. And how we can take care of our teeth better is to come in for an examination and determine is it tooth decay or is it gum disease? And that's probably the most, the most common complaint that I hear is, do I have a cavity or, do, or, or is something else wrong? Sure, certainly there's a lot of other dental issues that, that do come up and there's a, a lot that goes on in the mouth, but these are the two most common is cavities and gum disease, periodontal disease. So the second stage is early periodontal disease. The third stage is called moderate periodontal disease. So now the bone level has dropped. I don't have x-rays to show here, but I can show a tooth that is sitting half in bone, half out of bone. So if that tooth is sitting in the bone halfway, it is just half in the bone. Like my old uh, professor used to say, half truth ain't nothing but a lie. So that tooth is just sitting in the bone and it may have a little support, but the roots of the teeth are sensitive because they're exposed. The bone is dropped and they're sensitive. And that patient will always come in and say, I have a cavity here or something's wrong here. And what it is, the bone has dropped and it's exposed the root portion of the tooth. And that portion has a layer called cementum around it and it can be very, very sensitive, very sensitive, particularly if there's the, this bacteria is still around the root. 
underneath the gum, underneath the gum tissue, the gums will be pronounced and they'll be very puffy and they'll be very red. And that's how you'll know if you have a more serious form of gum disease is when you see the redness and the puffiness. So let's go into the third stage. The third stage is, mo is moderate uh, periodontal disease. Now the treatment is a little bit more severe. So again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We can stop these things very early by detecting them early. Sim similarly to any other medical condition in the body, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure. If they're combated early, you can eradicate. And similar in the mouth, if you can get this bacteria and fight it off quickly, and some of the stories we've heard from COVID that happen so rapidly are because this virus, different from bacteria, but a virus will, will infiltrate and cause these respiratory problems. And it happens very quickly. Viruses spread very, very quickly. So we're not talking about a virus in the mouth. We're talking about bacteria, which can lead to other viral activity if it's left untreated. But it's, it starts off as a bacterial infection. So we're still in the third stage, which is um, moderate periodontal disease. So the bacteria have infiltrated, the tooth, the teeth are slightly more loose. There's loss of bone. There is inflammation. The patient's mouth is probably very sore. So they require more aggressive scaling, root planing. We have to use instrumentation to get underneath the gum tissue to the bone level, be it the lower mandible jaw or the upper maxillary jaw. And we have to use in, uh, in instrumentation and particularly in the posterior regions where people can't brush. It's very hard to reach your, your first, second molars on the top or even on the bottom or the wisdom teeth. And quite a few wisdom teeth are extracted every day because the patient wasn't able to brush and wasn't able to reach back into those areas. So that's the third stage. It does require treatment, more aggressive treatment with scaling and root planing antibiotic therapy, uh, locally administered antibiotics, which is called Arrestin. They are actually placed into the pockets and allowed to sit for 12, 14 days to, to combat the bacterial growth. So that's what we do in the third stage. The fourth stage is, is let's, let's review, mild, moderate, and heavy. So there, this is the fourth stage of periodontal disease. It's called advanced. At this stage, unfortunately, we're, we're considering extracting all of this patient's teeth. And I feel very uh, strong about this stage because this is the stage where we have to make a determination whether this person will live the remaining years on this earth with or without teeth. Um, it does become an emotional time for a lot of people because either they've come to see me too late, I wasn't able to treat the disease fast enough, or they didn't get adequate treatment, and now the teeth have to be removed. And we have to consider implants, partials, dentures, or some type of replacement to give that patient their, their foundation of teeth back. So. I, 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 in our office, we, we, we are very vigilant about treating gum disease in the early stages, one, two, and three, before it gets to stage four, because stage four usually means that the patient will have to do periodontal surgery, and at times it will not be successful, and or start the process of extractions and dentures, which can be uncomfortable for some patients. So the topic again is prevention and um, trying to keep a, a healthy smile. So this is, is the way you keep a healthy smile is to stay in type one and manage type two very closely. You should be in the dental office 
three to four times a year. You have to start changing your diet. You have to brush and floss in a different manner, which you're accustomed to doing, possibly using electric toothbrushes, uh, different dentrifices, different types of fluorides are, are helpful, prescription fluorides. And I have a good team of hygienists that, that really uh, work with the patient and they work with what is, is in that patient's best interest for their individual use. And remember, everyone is different. So what I, what I may recommend to one patient may not be applicable to the next. Some patients I can say, sit down, we're gonna clean your teeth in five minutes and we'll be done and you'll be back to work. And I can comfortably say that. Others, I say, no, Mrs. Johnson, we need two separate appointments. I need to see you at least 45 minutes each appointment. You're going to be numb. We're going to use local anesthesia. We're going to be able to numb the area and we're going to go down in and get all the harmful bacteria out that you cannot get on your own. Similar to going into a cave. You can't find everything on your own, in your own mouth. You think you're doing a good job brushing, but you're probably not. And I haven't even touched on flossing, but that is, uh, flossing is one of the ways uh, that we can eliminate bacteria in between the teeth and it's neglected by a lot of people and it leads to cavities in between the teeth and it can contribute to gum disease as well. Um, how are we doing on time? I think we're doing okay. Um, Dr. Black, you have 10 more minutes. Okay. Okay. Very good. So let's, um, in a nutshell, Periodontal disease is is the is the cause of dental problems. In my mind, it is as a practicing dentist. There's other problems that can arise, but I want to establish the link between gum disease and systemic health, the link between gum disease and overall body health, because that I feel moving forward will allow people of all ages, starting at a young age, to take care of their teeth better. You remember uh, back in um, the 60s, I think 1960s, I was born in 67. So in the 60s, that was when the water in majority of cities became fluoridated. So they applied fluoride to the tap water, even though one, don't, not too many people drink tap water. I don't feel anything is wrong with tap water, but a lot of people don't drink tap water for a number of reasons. But the good thing about tap water is that it contains fluoride and it contains fluoride in most metropolitan cities. And that was a law passed. I think maybe Kennedy was president I was reading and fluoride was implemented in the water system. So that significantly helped dental caries and cavities in young kids. And that's why I've seen now that a lot of the younger uh, generation under the age of 12 don't have cavities like they did in the 70s and the 80s is because of the fluoridation of water. So that alone will help you build strong enamel and strong teeth through your life. That doesn't help with your brushing and flossing habits, but it will help you to build strong enamel and strong and strong teeth. So the application of fluoride is very important when we're dealing with these bacteria. Fluoride doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria. It's not bactericidal, but fluoride is an element that is in our water system that will help with the mineralization of bone, bone tissue, um, uh, hard tissue and patients, let's say with osteoporosis, they've been depleted of a lot of fluoride in their, in their body. Dr. Black, we have a question. Sure. And the question reads, is alkaline water better or does it matter? Alkaline water, yes, it is better and it is better. I haven't seen a number of studies on it, but yes, you wanna create an, an alkaline more of a neutral to an alkaline environment in the mouth. And the alkaline water can help. But remember, 
you drink alkaline water, you swallow it, it goes away and the mouth goes back to its acidic state. And then once we eat again, uh, it goes back to an acidic state again. So yes, it is helpful. Yes, it is helpful if you, if you drink it all, all the time. That was the only question. Thank you, Ms. Ivy, for your questions. We have five more minutes. Does anybody else have a question? You can type it into the comments so I can hand it over to the doctor. Dr. Black, I like to thank you. You did an awesome job. I'd like to thank everybody for signing on to the Zoom. I'd like to thank all the first time goers. Next year, hopefully it'll be virtual. Our doctors will be back. Oh, we have we do have one last question. So let me read the question. Um, does water does the water you drink? How much does that help you with your dental disease? Repeat the question again. I want to say that she's asking the amount of water you drink. Does that help with any dental diseases? I wouldn't say the amount of water you drink would help with any dental diseases. Certainly water is very beneficial for us in general, but it water alone is not going to help. What's going to help with dental disease is vig vigilant brushing, flossing, and um, diet and your diet, meaning consuming less sugary snacks, sugary, sugary foods, carbohydrate related foods. Okay, and any toothpaste, the other question is about toothpaste. Can you go over your statement about toothpaste? Well, I, I recommend a fluoridated toothpaste with fluoride. That's the first thing. And um, it should have the ADA seal of approval on the back. You'll see it on the box of Colgate. It has ADA approval. Um, that means the American Dental Association has approved that toothpaste as the highest quality toothpaste for the best optimal health. Um, Crest, Colgate are uh, two brands that are the top uh, brands that are probably out there. Uh, I see someone says Par Paradontax. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a decent brand. It, uh, some of these toothpastes have a lot of extra potassium nitrate and different fillers that don't really help at all, they found. So it's best to stick with the Crest and the Colgate with fluoride. Oh, and to eliminate alcohol rinses too. Okay. And then the other question, we had another question that came in um, about electrical toothbrushes, all the fancy electrical toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. Does that make a difference versus just using a regular toothbrush? Well, it, well yes, it does. It does. Uh, mechanical electric toothbrushes are, they remove plaque about three to four times faster than uh, an, a regular toothbrush, a manual toothbrush. And they seem to get the job done quicker and better. So you don't have to spend $200 on electric toothbrush. I have some in, in my office that are in the uh, 35, 45 degree, uh, $45 uh, range. And they seem to be suitable for most patients. Some have a lot of bells and whistles and timers and music. I mean, that's all fun and that's all fine and dandy if you like that. They're good for the children, I think. But um, generally a good $50 toothbrush by Oral-B or um, Sonicare and Philips. I have so Oral-B in, in our office. Uh, seems to work the best. Okay, and then about flossing. We have yeah. a question about PK, peak flossing compared to regular flossing. Can you go over the flossing procedures, flossing. please? Uh, floss, flossing is very important. Uh, generally, you want to use an unwaxed floss, unwaxed floss. There's waxed and there's unwaxed. So you want to use an unwaxed floss. It seems to glide in between contacts a little bit better and it, it breaks the contact. And I, when I'm examining patients, I always show them a large tooth next to another tooth. And I show them how there's in between, there's bad bacteria again. And so we have to break that contact with uh, floss, floss threaders, floss 
uh, picks. Um, the law, these picks that look like this, they're pretty convenient. You can keep them in your pocket. You can keep them in your purse. And I give those out daily to patients. They work very well. We have another question that came in. How often should you change your toothbrush? That's a good question. Uh, the bacteria that co collect in our mouths, and that's why I mentioned earlier, we have a three month periodontal recare because that bacteria will start to colonize in about 90 days in all humans. So it's going to colonize in your mouth and it's probably colonizing on your three month old toothbrush. So that's usually a good marker is the three month point or when the bristles, bristles start to look frayed and sprayed everywhere, it's time to change your toothbrush in the three month mark. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions for the doctor? Okay, if not, Dr. Black, I would like to thank you on behalf of the City of Carson and Women's Conference for joining us and being the doctor for the hour. Um, again, I'd like to thank everyone new that's just signed on. Hopefully, again, that we will be live next year. You'll be able to see the doctor next year live. We had a good amount of people in the class. We have our mayor, Lula Davis Holmes, on. <coughs> you, doctor. Hi, how are you today, Mayor? I'm hey, fine, Doctor. How are you? Just oh, popping in, thanking everyone for coming out to this, our virtual women's conference. This is our seventh year, and we could not put this on without our doctors taking time from their busy schedule. So I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate the fact that you did join us today. We normally have all women doctors, but I always have a thorn in between the roses. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Did she mute herself? Mayor, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. I did. Head. Did you okay. hear anything I said? Yeah, you just, for some reason, just muted. It just muted. But anyway, thank you, doctor. And we'll be back next year, bigger, better, and stronger. But we did want to continue with this, our seventh annual. It's all about me, Women's Health Conference. Uh, last year, we had about 600 plus women. So we're gonna invite you back next year so they can hear your wonderful presentation. I've been popping in and out of the room. So thank you to all the staff, all the volunteers and ladies for taking time to join us this morning. Hope you enjoy your, your little bags that we handed out. If you haven't received them, you should have, uh, if you registered a little goodie bag from us. Thank you, Mickey. You're welcome, Mayor. Dr. Arnold, would you like to say anything? Well, uh, hi, my dear brother. You are amazing as always. You bring wealth of knowledge. I tell you, that's why I keep going to you all these years so I can still have these beautiful teeth and smile. Unmute yourself, Dr. Arnold. I'm just so, wait a minute, I'm frozen, hold on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm frozen. So frozen in my heart, no. <laughs> But I'm warming my heart for you, Dr. Black. You've always been so kind. Going to your office is going to family. And so when you're around family, you feel loved, you feel safe. And even though dentists, everybody's scared of going to the dentist, you still make it a loving and inviting environment for us to take care of ourselves. So we just thank you. Oh, they want to know where you're located, Dr. Black. We have a question, Dr. Black, from um, the Sansbury. They would like to know where your office is. Or are you taking new patients? You Unmute need, yourself, Dr. Dr. Black. Unmute yourself. Did it not unmute? Hold on, doctor. Let me unmute you. Oh, OK. You got it? Doctor, unmute yourself. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah, yes, we are taking new patients and, and the address is 3015 Crenshaw Boulevard. I'm gonna type that into the chat right now, 3015. Crenshaw Boulevard.
And I can give the phone number if you'd like. Uh, yes, please. 323. 323-731-731-0801. 0801. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is, ladies, I just want to remind you that when you exit this Zoom room, that you're to go back to the main screen where there will be some additional announcements and our entertainment will be there. You know, if we were virtual, we would be actually having lunch right now. <laughs> um, so I get, I'd like to thank you for you guys that have your books, make sure you open your books up. We are gonna, the city is getting ready for their virtual, their drive-through uh, Halloween for the family and friends. I want to say thank you again. Thank you to Dr. Black. Thank you so much. Thank you to our MC, Dr. Dr. Arnold. I will see everybody in the main screen. Again, thank you. Thank you again from the city of Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job.